How's everybody doing today? Oh, it's a beautiful day in the Lord. Did y'all enjoy the worship this morning? Oh, man, thank God for the praise team. Over the last couple of weeks, we started this new series called Lead Like Jesus. And Pastor Dave talked about the way that Jesus leads with courage, and he took us on a journey of Jesus' life as he exhibited courage. And then last week, he talked a little bit about the importance of being a servant as a leader. And leaders, if they're going to be like Jesus, that they need to, to serve. Today, we're going to talk about something that does not come easy for most leaders. It doesn't come easy for most people. And that is self-control. Self-control is a a leadership trait that is so critical, but often overlooked. Self-control is something that is taught to children, but usually by the time you become an adult, sometimes you forget what you taught the children. Self-control is something that is so important that God has made it part of his fruit. And so, Lord, today, we come to you. God, just asking you to teach each and every one of us, God. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. Give us enough self-control to allow you to penetrate our hearts with your word. And so, God, we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I've been studying on this topic in preparation for today, and I have a confession. My confession is that I do not have the best self-control. I'm okay, I'm okay, but I can do a lot better. You know, as I was reflecting, one of the ways that, uh, as it relates to self-control, is uh, I, I, I like fried chicken. I'll just be honest with you, I like, I like fried chicken. I like the, the smell of fried chicken. I like when that wing is purchased and flowered so delicately. I don't know if you've ever had fried chicken with cornmeal. Oh, my goodness. And that wing is just folded just right and put in that grease. (laughs) And the smell that just comes out. Like if they had fried chicken incense, I would probably burn it in my office. (laughs) I just love fried chicken. Now, Here's the truth, though. I haven't eaten fried chicken in about 10 years. I really like it, but one day I just made the decision that I'm not going to eat meat anymore, so I haven't had any any fried chicken in about 10 years. So when I go to Chick-fil-A, I get french fries. Now, I also like ice cream. I really, really like ice cream. So if you ever want to get me a gift, you can give me a gift card to get some, some ice cream, because I have not given that up. <laughs> and I'm not a picky person when it comes to ice cream. Vanilla is, is fine. It could be Turkey Hill. It could be Baskin Robbins. It could be Carvel. It could be Ben & Jerry's. It could be Edie's. It could be Carvel. It could be Dairy Queen. It could be Friendly's. I am not picky when it comes to ice cream. I just want some ice cream. That is fine. Y'all don't understand the the degree of how much I like ice cream is I will leave my house after 10 o'clock at night to go to the supermarket to get a pint of Haagen-Dazs because I love ice cream so much. I have no self-control when it comes to ice cream. One of the gyms that that I go to, Nine Round, right next door to it is... uh, is a place that 
make smoothies. And I've noticed lately that I go to the smoothie shop more than I go to the gym. <laughs> when I go to Planet Fitness, right here in Waldorf, right down the street from Planet Fitness is a giant. If you go into the giant and you turn left, you go to aisle 24. Now, aisle is not marked. It's actually aisle 22. They stopped putting the markers up, but trust me, if you go to aisle 24 and you turn right, as soon as you make that right turn, you open up the freezer, and right there is some delicious haagen dazs ice cream. I promise you. And so after a good workout, I'll grab myself some ice cream. Now, I do try to balance it out because I'll go to the other end of the store. I'll go to produce, and I'll at least get, get a banana so I can make a sundae. That'll offset the, the ice cream, son. I feel like after a good workout, I, I, I deserve it. <laughs> I mean, I deserve ice cream. I have no self-control when it comes to ice cream. Sometimes our biggest adversary to self-control is that we think we deserve something and we really don't necessarily deserve it. Sometimes we feel like we deserve to be heard and so we're going to say we have no self-control because this person is going to hear what I got to say. Sometimes we lack self-control because we think we deserve to buy that new home or buy that new car or to buy that new whatever It's often the things that we think we deserve is the biggest enemy to us having self-control. This morning we're going to look at Matthew 26. And in the book of Matthew, at this point in Scripture, Jesus knows that it's only a few days away before he is going to to be crucified. And all of these things start happening to Jesus and around Jesus a few days before he's going to be crucified, and we see Jesus exhibiting great self-control, and so we're going to try to learn from him this morning. Matthew 26, starting at verse 6. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, A woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. And when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. And when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. I have learned that sometimes we need self-control when people question our actions. Verse 8, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. The disciples questioned the actions that really had nothing to do with them. Are there any uh, parents in the church this morning? One of my challenges comes when one of my kids questions my actions. I don't know about y'all, but at least one of my children, if not all of my children, at least one of my children, sometimes when I say something, they ask me why. Anybody else have kids like that? Now, I don't know about you when people question your actions, but sometimes my response to my children is because I... Oh, okay, so y'all, y'all learn just like me because I said so. And then if somebody else questions my actions and I don't have self-control, sometimes I just want to say, mind your, mind 
It's your business. The disciples asked this woman, or really were talking amongst themselves, and they were saying, why this waste? And to question this woman was to actually question Jesus himself. Well, I had a nerve to question the actions of this woman and the actions of Jesus. And what I like, though, is in verse 10, We go back, it says, aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. And when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare for burial. If you want to have self-control when people question your actions, the best thing you can do if you want to lead like Jesus is to explain it to them with a respectful response. Might not always feel like it, but if you want to lead like Jesus, you need to explain it to them with a respectful response. And so when I'm talking to my kids, because I said I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm, I still have room to grow. I'm talking to my children. Instead of saying, because I said so, I could say, Verse 10, why are you bothering this woman? Son, why are you bothering this man? (laughs) I need you to do what I asked you to do because if you don't, verse 12, I'm going to prepare a burial for you. (laughs) Or y'all figure out some more respectful way to say it, but I'm just saying, explain it to them with a respectful response. That's the point here. The story of Jesus' life continues when we get to verse 23. Jesus is preparing for the festival of unleavened bread. They're about to celebrate the the Passover. And we get to verse 23. It says, Jesus replied. He's talking about somebody is about to, that the crucifixion is going to happen. He knows who it's going to be. And so we get here. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. And then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely you don't mean me, rabbi. Jesus answered, you have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread When we had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Sometimes we need self-control when people closest to us betray us. Verse 23 and 24 again, Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Now, let me explain this to you. Jesus knew that Judas, one of his closest 12, was going to betray him. Jesus selected Judas to be part of the 12. Jesus, not so long ago, just got finished washing Judas' feet. Judas knew the mission. Judas had seen everything that Jesus had done. Sometimes those that are closest to us end up being the ones to betray us, and it takes so much self-control to deal with that. I'm an NBA fan. 
I like sports in general, but one of the sports is the NBA. And 2008, this uh, power team in Boston was, was formed. And this guy joined the team, and um, he was arguably one of the best shooters in NBA history. As a matter of fact, he currently holds the record for three-point field goals made. He was knocking down shots all over the place, and he helped them win a championship. A few seasons later, he decides that he's going to leave Boston, and he's going to go to a rival team in Miami. He wanted to play with LeBron now. And they end up winning the championship. His teammates in Boston to this day still do not talk to him. They felt so betrayed. Some of them in interviews have cussed them out, and all you hear, beep, 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 they had to censor everything. And sometimes, as people, we lose self-control when we are hurt by those that are closest to us. Sometimes a spouse may cheat on the person that they're with, and because they are felt so betrayed, they lose self-control, and instead of just trying to work through the situation, they go ahead and find somebody else for themselves too. Self-control becomes difficult often when people betray us, but if we go back to verses 26 through 29, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and we had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When people closest to you betray you, the best thing that you can do if you are going to live like Jesus and lead like Jesus is to stay focused on what God has called you to do. I had this one friend that that insists when, when people betray her, I tell her, two wrongs don't make a right, but she quickly says, well, two wrongs make it even. But this same friend gets so distracted on what she's supposed to be doing because she now spends her time trying to make things even. What Jesus did in this situation was Judas was was set to betray him and uh, Jesus stayed focused on what God had called him to do. And so he still said, look, this is my body that is going to be broken for everybody. Whether you betray me or not, Jesus stayed focused on what God called them to do. We jump down to verse 31. Then Jesus told them this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Sometimes you need self-control when people inappropriately challenge your knowledge. Peter had the nerve to tell Jesus that he didn't know what he was talking about. Now, this is the same Jesus that not too long ago had took Peter out into the deep when they couldn't get any fish. Because Jesus knew what he was talking about, but all of a sudden, Jesus doesn't know what he was talking about. Matthew 16, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, and this is Peter, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so Peter knew exactly who Jesus was. He knew he was the Messiah. Who knows more than the Messiah? Sometimes... People inappropriately challenge your knowledge. And sometimes 
it may make you want to strangle them. And that's when we need to apply self-control. And so I like the way Jesus handled it. In verse 34, he says, truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Sometimes you just have to state your case and allow others to look foolish later. You see, if you know the story of Peter, you know that he eventually does disown Jesus. And the rooster does crow. Sometimes we want to just make sure that people know just how right we are, that we tend to waste our time going back and forth with people. The way Jesus handled it is he said, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And you know what? He even gave Peter the last word. Because when you have self-control, you don't have to argue back and forth with people that have no idea what you know. And moving on in the, the story, the last week of, of Jesus, we go to verse 36, and it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Sometimes we need self-control when people do not do their job. It can be so frustrating when you have work to do and you have to work with a team. You have to work with other people and the people, some of the people that you work with refuse to do their job. They sit in that work on their phones, on Facebook, posting notes, doing whatever else except doing their job. Sometimes we lose self-control when we have to pick up the slack for other people. And I can tell you, if I was to walk through my life right now, I could give you all tons of examples of when that has frustrated me. But we're going to get right now just into the solution for this. He said in verse 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. When people around you don't do their job, the way to lead with self-control like Jesus is to simply pray and encourage Because in this situation, the disciples, three of them, Peter and the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, all they were asked to do was to go watch because Jesus was struggling. He knew that he was about to die. And all he did was say, look, you have one job, and that's stay on watch. But they fell asleep. Jesus continued to pray. And he encouraged them. He said, you know what? I believe that your intentions were good. Even though you didn't do your job, I believe your intentions were good. The spirit is willing. But the flesh is weak. Then we get to our fifth area where Jesus is applying self-control. And that's starting at the 51st verse. And so the the men are finally coming to to get Jesus. Everything that Jesus had been struggling with, his, his, his sorrow, his frustration at times, is now coming to a point. In verse 51, with that, 
one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Sometimes we need self-control when people anger us. Now, in this particular case, Jesus has just been betrayed by Judas. The people have come to get Jesus. And Peter is quick with his sword and he cuts off the servant's ear because he was angry. And one of the things that Jesus tried to explain to Peter was that, look, I got this taken care of. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will once at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But instead, what he was trying to tell Peter is that, one, I have it all taken care of. But two, violence is not the answer. Now, I want to be very clear about this. If you have relationships with someone that is violent to you, you do not need to be in that situation. No man has any right to lay his hands on any woman. And no woman has any right to lay her hands on any man. In this situation, Peter was so quick because of his anger, he just quickly just cut off the servant's ear. So not only did Peter need self-control, but sometimes we need self-control when we're around that crazy friend that does stuff when he gets angry. The final area that I want to talk about as it relates to self-control, because it ties into this, is verse 48. It says, now the betrayer, so Judas gave a signal. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Verse 55, in that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. Sometimes you need self-control when people act like they don't know you. People see you on a regular basis and then all of a sudden they get out somewhere else and then they act like they don't know who you are. But we walking down the street, you're going to look me dead in my face and you're going to just act like I'm a complete stranger. Sometimes we need self-control when people behave like that. Jesus has been doing ministry for for for. He's, he's, he's around the age of 33 right now. He's been doing ministry actively for at least three years. He's done so much, and these people want to act like they had no idea who Jesus was? This is the same Jesus that healed the centurion servant. This was the same Jesus that calmed the storm. This was the same Jesus that walked on water. This was the same Jesus that turned water to wine. This was the same Jesus that fed 5,000 with somebody else's lunch. This was the same Jesus that healed the paralytic. The same Jesus that gave sight to the blind. The same Jesus that was teaching in their synagogues and all of a sudden you want to act like you don't know him? And sometimes people get brand new when they're around 
other people because of their sin. So the way that Jesus handled this, whether it was people that were angry or people that acted like they didn't know him, is in verse 56. And it says, but this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Whether people get you angry or people act like they don't know you, the best thing that you can do is to see God's glory and you overcoming the situation. But this is all taking place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Self-control is so critical because it helps you reveal God's glory. It provides evidence that you are a child of God because the fruit of the spirit after love, joy, peace, goodness, at the very end is self-control. And so no matter what life throws our way, if we are going to be like Jesus, if we're going to follow after Jesus, we have to have self-control. Self-control can be applied to anything in life. And so, brothers and sisters, today, as we try to represent him, I encourage you all to have the same self-control that Jesus had so that we can reveal his glory in this world. Let us pray. And so, God, we come to you this morning thanking you for your lessons, God. God, sometimes we just feel like we deserve everything, but your word tells us that the earth is yours and the fullness thereof. And that includes our behavior. And so, God, I just ask you right now to help us all have better self-control because we need it. This world is in a dark place, Lord, but we have the ability to show your glory as we be an example of what it means to be under your control. And so, God, I ask that you guide us today. Continue to work in us, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.